Hello, folks. Welcome back. And this is our final 8th Air Force show this week. And it has, pardon the pun, flown by. And I frankly, I can't wait to get my teeth into the subject again next year when hopefully we'll have news of, of Masters of the Air. But having looked at a couple of the bomb groups, we've looked at the FLAC and we've looked at the uh, United Air Command. We're now going to look at the absolutely vital and often overlooked of the women who were alongside the 8th Air Force over these hundreds of bases across East Anglia, particularly East Anglia. My guest, Sophie Green, is a living historian. She grew up in East Anglia, and she, I want to make it clear at the beginning, she has been invited on to talk about the women, but she can talk about the men as well and the, uh, the aircraft and the equipment and the stuff. It's just that we're using her knowledge of the women today, but I'll bring her in. Um, so good evening, Sophie. How are you today? Hello, I'm good, thank you. Good. So, um, I mean, you, I said it there, you grew up in East Anglia. So like myself, you grew up with all these eight Air Force bases around you. So kind of mm. crass question to begin with. How, when did you first kind of become aware of this massive, great American invasion of the place you grew up in? So I think I was probably, I've always had a fascination in um, the Second World War since I was really little. Um, things like evacuees always used to fascinate me. Um, anything else to do with the war, I used to just love it if we did anything at school. Um, and it wasn't until I was about 12 or 13, my dad realised I was starting to have this interest. Um, so he decided to introduce me to my local airfield, which is um, Framlingham, where I live here in Fram. Um, and he took me there on one of their open days and they actually had Sally B coming in and she did a fly past. And I was just absolutely godsmacked at the fact this had been on my doorstep all my life, literally within walking distance of my house. And I never knew about it. My dad had driven me across it and I'd never taken notice of the, you know, the stretches of concrete or the derelict buildings. It, you just take it's so, you know, norm around here to have that with farms that I just never realised. Um, and it just then started that question of why didn't I know about it, but I want to know more about it. So started reading. And then at the age of 14, I then started to volunteer at that museum at Param Airfield. Um, and it's just snowballed ever since, really. So, you know, over the years with the 8th Air Force and then starting living history and um, doing all the American women's roles during the Second World War. Um, yeah, it's just it's just snowballed, really. Um, and I'm now a, a committee member for the 95th Bomb Group Museum. Um, I've been a volunteer there now for 10 years. Um, so, yeah, that's what I spend, where I spend my free time is up there doing doing stuff for the 95th. Well, brilliant stuff. So you've come armed with an amazing PowerPoint. So we'll kind of dive straight in. Again, no pun intended. And I'll hand over to Sophie. And folks, I don't know whether we'll 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 do quite you'll need to ask questions because I think there's an amazing amount of information coming your way. But if you do have questions, as usual, fire them up and we'll ask Sophie as we go along. But basically, I'm gonna hand over to Sophie to tell us about um the girls of Little America. Lovely, thank you very much. So this is a subject of mine um, that I've researched heavily over the last 10 years or so. It all started with a photo um, I discovered in the Bomb Group history of the 390th, actually. Um, and there was a photo in the officers club. And in the foreground were a couple of women sat in the officers club and they were in uniform. And, and I asked, sort of at the question at the time, I was, who, who, are these? Who, are these, who are these girls in this photo? Well, I've not seen photos of women in uniform on an American base up until that point. I'd seen plenty of civilian women dotted around, but um, none in uniform. So I first sort of thought, well, and it just, and all the captions said it at the bottom was nurses of the 65th um, enjoying drinks in the officers club or something like that. So I instantly started, who, who were the 65th? Who, who, were, who were they and where were they? And it just went from there, really. And after that, I just wanted to know more and more about these girls. Um, so I have obviously over the last few years done a huge amount of research, a lot of first hand accounts, met a lot of family members whose mothers were here during the Second World War. And um, so I'm really lucky in that respect. Um, and in my PowerPoint today, that a huge amount of these photos are from my private archive of photos that I've got over the years being given from family members and um, various sort of bomb group associations and stuff like that. Um, so I suppose what I'm what I'm going to cover is um, my my PowerPoint, the Girls of Little America. This is one that I do for quite a few different groups, um, and it covers all the all the different services that the women had um, that worked alongside the the Eighth Air Force, um, and I also look a little bit to why as as to why it's gone so uncovered over the years. Why has it never been mentioned before? Um, 
and why has it taken us this long to really look into this sort of thing so we'll get started so i suppose the first thing we think of um you know with, with the eighth air force and with the friendly invasion um these are the sort of things that that pop to mind you know the dancing um moaning about warm beer oversexed, overpaid over here gi brides got any gum chum all of these things come to mind um but the women aren't the first thing that come to anybody's mind. These American women, no one ever thinks about that when you mention the friendly invasion. Um, so that's sort of something that we're going to be having a look at. So this young man here is uh, Private First Class Milburn Henke. He was the first, officially the first American um, to reach our shores during the Second World War. Obviously, there was a lot before that. There always is, like the whole Memphis Bell story. It, it's the official one, but there's always more to it than that. Um, but he marked the start of um, Operation Bolero, as we know it, um, and the arrival of the Americans on our shores here in the UK. So over the next two years, most of the ports on in Western Britain look like this, um, round full of GIs. Um, and, you know, it, the, the a figure that always amazes me is in June of 1944, that very early first part of June, there's 1.5 million of them in the UK. And that just flabbergasts me that there can be that many in the UK. Um, but in that 1.5 million, there's actually 17,000 of those are women. Um, which a lot of people don't realise. So um, that's, you know, a little bit of a, a statistic there, um, there for you. So my little little corner of England, East Anglia, um, you can see absolutely peppered with American air bases, obviously, and amongst those, you also have the RAF bases as well. Um, so that just goes to show just how spread out they were in the area, but also just how close together they were. I mean, here um, at Framlingham, um, if I can travel in any direction for 20 minutes and hit another airfield, I've got Horham, I've got I, I've got Debich, you know, I've got Layston, you know, I'm literally surrounded by them. And, you know, a tiny bit further than that, I've got I and Thorpe Abbotts and everything else. So it, it really did have a massive impact on, on my local area. Um, you know, we were more used to seeing scenes like this in East Anglia, you know, it's very quiet, very low population and we were very backwards as well at, at that point in time you know many houses didn't have electricity running water main sewerage none of that so this massive influx of americans into into this area had a huge 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 impact um you know a lot of these houses if you were lucky enough to live on or very close to a base you'd suddenly find yourself with um, mains electricity and running water and things like that as a little bit of a perk um but, you know, it suddenly became here in East Island became home to 185,000 men. And, you know, in somewhere, you know, like my sleepy little town of Framlingham, that would have been a massive shock to the system. Mm. Um, I mean, it's still a very small town, very, very rural. And I think if we still had a group of 3000 Yanks arrive on my doorstep, it would still have a massive effect. So how... You know, I can't imagine what people felt at that point in time, having this massive force arrive on their doorstep. So these were the scenes people would have got used to. Again, these young men um, filling our local pubs and our local um, sort of beauty spots and things like that. The two chaps on the top left enjoying some fish and chips in Norwich. Um, but again, it's still no matter despite this impact, the women still didn't come into it. Um, they still don't come into that whole thing of, of the friendly invasion and Operation Bolero and things like that. So, um, you know, we'll have a look at a few of the few of the different roles that the women had while they were here. So there are three main branches of service. Obviously, there are a few much smaller um, organisations that were also here, but we'll cover the main three. Otherwise, we'll be here all night. Um, so uh, the first one we have is the Women's Army Corps um, and then we have the American Red Cross and the Army Nurse Corps. So they're the main three that operated alongside the 8th Air Force here in the UK. So we'll start up with the United States Army Nurse Corps. Um, this is the oldest female branch of the United States Army. Um, they were formed in 1901. And at the outbreak of World War II, um, so we're talking 1939, they only had 672 nurses on their books. Um, obviously nowhere near enough to take to war. Um, but by 
the um, by Pearl Harbor, um, sort of in, in December of 41, that had increased to 7,000. So these girls were getting some idea at that point in time already, something big was going to happen. Um, and more of these qualified nurses um, started to, to join the army. Just a question for you, Sophie. Well, I know when we talk about, for example, in Australia, there were the, the some units could go overseas and some units couldn't. With, yeah. the, with the American enlistment of women, was there any kind of different classification about where you could be sent and some could stay only say stateside and some could go overseas or was it anybody could go any, anywhere? Yeah, so a f different organisations op 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 um, op sort of operated slightly differently. So the army, a lot of them asked if the girls wanted to go overseas and obviously a majority did. It was a huge adventure for these young mm. women. Um, same as the men, it, you know, they, they, at that age you have no fear. So there was no worry about, you know, what might happen. Um, so then they could hand pick the girls that went over, those with the most skills, um, those with the skills that would be the most useful and things like that. Um, the Army Nurse Corps pretty much went to all um, theatres of operation, the same as the American Red Cross. But when we look, the um, the Women's Army Corps didn't go to all the theatres of operation. They only went where they were really, really needed. Um, so so we'll have a look at that as, as we go along, definitely. So in the 1940s, America was suffering a huge shortage of nurses um, and with the war looming, that did encourage more girls to qualify and study to become a nurse. But it wasn't until um, July of 1945 that America actually said they had enough nurses. So it wasn't until after victory in Europe that they had enough nurses to do what they needed to do. So the whole war, America was operating on a shortage of nursing staff. Um, so with that in mind, they started their recruitment campaign in early 1942. Um, and they sort of did did an okay job at recruiting nurses they had a lot of help from the american red cross any nurses that were working under the american red cross at the time were sort of pushed across to join the army instead because that's where they were going to be of most use um so you know they they started recruiting and sort of pushed it quite heavily for any any women that um were qualified so in order to join the army nurse corps um, these women had to be fully registered nurses. They had to have at least two years of hospital experience under their belt. Um, and as long as they met that criteria, um, they, they were sort of free to join in. Obviously, you had to be fairly fit as well um, in order to do that. So after enrolment, um, these girls would head into a four week of um, basic training. Um, and in that they'd learn um, some of the basic military organization, courtesy and custom, care of their clothing and their equipment, um, a bit of drill, physical training, all the things you sort of would expect for uh, any kind of military basic training. Um, and they'd also learn some stuff about um, defense against attack, um, gas attacks particularly, and how to defend themselves should, should the um, situation arise. Um, and also worth pointing out, um, similar to British Army, all the nurses at this point were officers. Um, this came after the First World War, when the nurses didn't have officer status and they suffered difficulties with men taking orders from women, not only because they had lower rank, but it was just because, you know, society at that point in time, you know, women were sort of lower down on that scale than, than men were. Um, so they decided to make women, all the women in the Army Nurse Corps, they decided to make all of them um, officers, not only just for... Um, so people take orders, but also to reflect the level of training and qualification that these young ladies held as well, which at the time was quite unusual for a young lady to be as educated as these young ladies were. So with that, we have the arrival of the first army nurses um, in 1942, along with those very first troops. Um, this is the only one, actually, I don't really have a date on. I know it was very early on, most likely on that same ship as uh, Milburn Henke. Um, but um, it wasn't it wasn't recorded when they first arrived, unfortunately. But I know it was very, very early on in, in 1942. Um, so these young ladies, as we can see here, travelled over on the same troop ships as the boys. Um, quite often there'd be a group of maybe 50 nurses among 3,000 young men on these boats, maybe up to 15,000, depending on the size. So, um, you know, you can really imagine being a very, you know, the ratio of men to women was was quite 
quite impressive. So um, one young lady I do know um, said that if, if she sneezed, she was presented with 400 handkerchiefs at the same time. So, um, and the girls also, their corridors on the on the ships were also guarded by MPs as well for that reason, um, just so they weren't being mobbed by the guys on their entire crossing over to the UK. Um, so, yeah, they came over. Um, they arrived in the same ports on, on the western coast of England, um, and then they arrived here. Most of them were then sent to Shrivenham, um, where they would receive um, some more training on self-defence um, and any bits of training that they couldn't cover in the United States, obviously anything that might pose a security threat, giving them some idea of where they're going, because obviously they could be going to Europe or going to the Pacific. And obviously, if they had training that would give them an inkling, then, you know, some people could the wrong information could get into the wrong hands and things like that. So some training wasn't done until they arrived at their destination. So here are some young ladies at Shrivenham learning a little bit more of their of their self-defense techniques. So as we move on, so here are the staff members of that 65th that I mentioned earlier, um, these young ladies that we um you know, I first saw in that photo. So the nurses stationed here in East Anglia um, were obviously mainly assigned to the 8th Air Force um, to work alongside them. Um, and so there was quite a few hospitals set up in this area um, to support the airfields. Um, I think it's worth pointing out that there's always a lot of confusion. Every airbase had a base hospital and that, you know, they all did that. Um, but these were only to treat minor injuries and illnesses, anything that required any kind of length of hospital stay, any kind of surgery or specialist care went to these bigger hospitals. And the confusion that always is, yes, there were hospitals on base, but there were no female nurses on those bases. That is always quite a common misconception. People say, oh, but there was a hospital, so there was nurses. There, there wasn't nurses in these base hospitals. They were only at these bigger organisations separate to the airfields. Um, so that that's one thing I always come across. People always sort of try and argue with me. But no, they you know, they I've got the odd picture um, of them possibly coming in to help out for a day, maybe if staff levels were short. But um yeah, they, they weren't. It's, it's the use of the word hospital in it, because in like with ground yeah. troops, we it kind of have clearing hand stations hand. and aid stations, and it's and it's understood yeah. that as you you move up the chain, things become more hospital-like. But I think yeah. the confusion comes with the air base is the use of the word hospital when it's more of a kind of a casualty clearing. Yeah, time, yeah. Right, I always it? say it's sort of more more like your GP practice, you yeah. know, where you'd have gone Assessment. if you got a bit of a yeah. scrape or a cough or a cold. Anything more, you'd have gone straight to straight to one of these much larger establishments further out. So um the numbers of the Army Nurse Corps in England outweighed any of the other female services. Um, so in about May of 44, there were 10 and a half thousand nurses in the UK. Um, and with the overall number of women being 17,000, obviously you can see that that ratio of, of nurses was much higher. Um, so uh, this is a group of nurses at one of the um, sort of hospitals that served the 8th Air Force bases. Um, this is Acton Place um, near Sudbury. Um, so the list, I know that list, very well, bizarrely. <laughs> you do, you do indeed. So, um, so here are the lovely nursing staff of that particular hospital. But just to name a few of the other hospitals, you have the 121st Station Hospital um, near Braintree, the the 136th at Sudbury, uh, the 65th General Hospital at Redgrave, which is the biggest one in the area, um, the 231st Station Hospital at what, what is now Wyndham College or formerly Morley Hall, and the 163rd Station Hospital at um, Wimpole, which is now owned by National Trust. Um, all of these hospitals would have had somewhere between 50 to 100 nurses working on them, possibly more when you get to the to the bigger general hospitals. Um, so, you know, and not only um, were these hospitals to treat wounded, they also acted like our hospitals do today. If, you know, any length, if anyone's anywhere for any length of time, you're going to get the ordinary illnesses pop up, appendicitis, infections, that kind of thing, that also need doctors and specialist care and possibly surgery, completely unrelated to their job, everyday ailments that need treatment as well. So they also had huge outpatient clinics as well at these hospitals. Um, so, you know, as, as as they moved on, all these young ladies were trained um, in specialist areas. 
Um, so these two young ladies here at the 65th General Hospital within the rehab unit there. Uh, the 65th were actually a specialist orthopaedic hospital and did some really quite pioneering surgeries at the time. Um, a lot of surgeries we take for granted today were practiced and tried out at this at this very hospital on my doorstep. Um, so, you know, as well as rehab, they'd be trained in, you know, specialist theatre nurses, um, lab work, anything like that. Um, but they also took it in turns to um, work on the shock ward. So the shock ward is the equivalent to what we'd know today as the intensive care unit or the resource area of A&E. But they didn't, no one was assigned to that job full time. They, they would rotate it on that because it was such a, you know, it was a very heavy job to do. 12 hours in an environment like that, if you were doing that day in, day out, you wouldn't last five minutes. So they recognised that and they were rotated. So maybe doing one day a week on that shock ward before going back to your usual area of the hospital, whatever ward or theatre you, you worked in normally. Um, so these girls, they work 12 hour shifts. They do 30 days on the trot without a day off. Um, this is something that really surprised me, actually, when I found that out. Um, and it wasn't until I read a, a personal account of one particular nurse that I realised that they were doing 30 days with no days off. Um, once they completed those 30 days, they'd be given four to six days off, maybe, um, and then go back into the next 30 day stint. So, you know, these girls, if they weren't working, I'd imagine they were probably asleep. Um, and they lived in a similar you know, accommodation to the men. They had no special treatment in regards to accommodation. They were set in the same Nissan huts, the same, you know, single tin skin huts, even tents at one point as well. Um, you know, when hospitals were still being built and things like that, and those nurses working night shifts were quite often put up in tents as well. So here in, in England, particularly in the winter, that is not going to be a pleasant experience for these young ladies. Um, you know, same as the men, they'd be have one pot belly stove if they were lucky to keep them warm. And that's if they could get the coal for it. Um, obviously, with with fuel rationing at the time in the UK, um, coal was very hard to come by. So um, I've, one of the nurses at the 65th um, recalls filling her metal canteen drinking bottle up, filling that every night with boiling water um, and wrapping it in a towel and putting it at the end of her bed. Um, but she ended up suffering quite nasty burns one night after the towel came off it and she ended up sticking her foot on a, a red hot canteen. So, um, you know, they would go into some pretty desperate methods to, to keep warm at that point in time. So next slide. Um, so as well as as well as the casualties from the 8th Air Force bases, um, obviously that was their primary role. That's what they were doing. Um, wounded would be unloaded from the aircraft, put in an ambulance, taken to the base hospital to give a quick assessment. If it was a minor injury, they might have been able to keep them at the base hospital, but most of them would have been sent straight to these bigger hospitals to receive immediate treatment and go straight into theatre. Um, so, but as well as that, these hospitals also actually um, took in casualties after D-Day um, and particularly in the Ardennes offensive as well. Uh, so, you know, these hospitals not only were taking in, you know, all these casualties coming off the local bases, they were also receiving them from the other end, coming in from mainland Europe with all these horrific injuries that were unable to be treated in, in Europe at the time. So they, the patients, as I mentioned, they'd be unloaded from their aircraft and arrived by ambulance. Um, but the patients arriving from mainland Europe were coming over in aircraft and then loaded onto hospital trains and then trains to the nearest station, then off there and onto an ambulance and would arrive here at the at the um, hospitals here in East Anglia. Um, I know it was, it was a really rough time through the Ardennes offensive. These hospitals were really struggling with the number of patients coming through. They weren't prepared for this kind of thing at all. Um, a lot of the nurses recall working 36 hour shifts at that point in time just to get through the sheer number of, of patients. Um, and I know Morley Hall had to erect temporary tent wards as well because they had so many they couldn't fit them in the wards. They got purpose built, so they were put in tents. So even though we were in England at that point and they were coming to these really well set up permanent hospitals, they still weren't prepared for, for what was coming with them, um, with patients coming in from Europe and from and from the 8th Air Force. Well, talking about being unprepared, sorry to interrupt you, Sophie, but I mean, it's come up in the in the course of this week with the bomb groups is that it's not just physical injuries. It's, of course, the mental 
yep. the, the, the traumas are flying and these missions and the fear of flak and you know you're about the Ardennes there some of these people have been yep. coming in in the units that were kind of badly overrun by the Germans so I, you know how much psychiatric training if any did these nurses have and how much did they just kind of just uh, have to adopt in kind of just common sense and 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 being a mother to these young men in some ways yeah so i've heard a lot of um you know there were nurses trained to work on the site they had specialist psychiatric wards in a lot of these hospitals um and quite often they were the ones that always operated at their fullest obviously um so some of these nurses were trained to work in these psychiatric hospitals um but from what i've heard they were quite quick to either get the men back on their feet and back to work or they would send them home quite quickly they didn't want these guys hanging around for any period of time to have an effect on those that weren't suffering from their mental health at that point in time okay. so they were quite quick to get them sorted and get them back to work or get them home and get them out of the way kind of thing. Um, but we'll talk about in a little while um, the mental health and the way that the Americans actually were really quite ahead compared to th like the British Army in the handling of mental health and the welfare of their troops um, and what they did to, pr to prevent that happening. So um, one nurse um, in particular of calls uh, when they had these influxes of patients from the Ardennes being they were all completely shocked at the state obviously they've been used to seeing these eighth air force flyers that were at home every evening and um, they were able to shave keep a clean uniform you know and then suddenly these battle casualties were coming in from from the Ardennes unshaven suffering from trench foot and frostbite and um, one nurse recalls patients coming in with wounds wrapped in rags and newspaper um, and a couple of men she even recalls they had their wounds sewn together with strands of hair because they had run out of suture material so these nurses who had been used to seeing these eighth air force flyers in reasonably good condition were completely horrified at the state these men were arriving in um, in the hospitals here in, in east anglia and this young lady here, you can see, this is Dorothea Salerno. She was a nurse at um, the 65th. And these are all men in full body cast sunbathing out on the lawn of the hospital, um, which I, I don't know how they even got them out there, to be honest, but um, they've managed it and she's she's watching over them, bless her. So the other, the other bit of the nurses um, that, we, um, I'll cover very briefly of flight nurses. Um, they had a very limited involvement with the 8th Air Force, um, but they did, some of them did have an involvement with the 8th. Um, so these girls were selected during their basic training um, to have special skills and say, you know, do you fancy have being one of these, these new flight nurses um, and training up to, to be one of these young ladies? Um, and these are the girls that um, travelled with the sick and the wounded on these evacuation flights, whether that be from mainland Europe back to England or whether it be back to England all the way back to the US. So, you know, you could be on a one hour flight or you could be on, you know, an eight, 12 hour flight with wounded men on board a, you know, a Dakota, which I would say is like a cattle truck on wings. It, you know, it's not really ideal for a, a really poorly chap with horrendous injuries to be on there for any period of time. So these young ladies, like I said, they'd accompany them on these flights. Um, you know, can't, they'd be taught to monitor them. Um, they'd know the effects that lack of oxygen would have on them whilst in the air. If they're going to get to any altitude, you know, they knew how to administer oxygen. They could provide emergency treatment if stuff was to go drastically wrong while they were in the air. Obviously, you know, you're not in a hospital at that point. There'd be a nurse and maybe a couple of enlisted men. And if something was to go wrong, you were in the air. There was not, you know, you had to just use what you've got to hand. So these girls had a lot of extra training in order in order to do that role. Um, and a few of the nurses, a lot of them, a lot of these nurses had already served in Italy and North Africa as flight nurses. And in that interim between that and, and Normandy, um, some of them were sent to 8th Air Force bases um, where they'd be welcomed onto the bases uh, and they'd help unload airmen see the kind of wounds that you know they might be seeing more of in normandy you know these quite catastrophic wounds that you know occur from you know large explosives and flak and things like that um and it just sort of you know gave them a little what a bit like work experience you know it just you know kept the the momentum going whilst they were waiting for for normandy to happen really um so there's two young ladies in this photo with the 94th bomb group um as a as a crew members being unloaded from his b17 there 
So, you know, I'm always surprised, you know, despite the physical and mental pressure these ladies were under, you know, doing that those 12 hours a day for 30 days on the trot, the things they were seeing, the jobs they were doing, they managed to do an incredibly good job. Um, and American hospitals, if you arrived wounded at an American hospital, your mortality rate at that point would be 4%, which is amazing. Um, and that was actually the lowest of all the Allied forces at the time. So, you know, these American hospitals were really, you know, really up their game compared to compared to other, um, you know, British forces and things like that. And I've, I've heard that British men would rather go to an American hospital because they'd heard how much better they were than the British. You know, their technology was so much further ahead. So uh, we come to the next one. Um, this is the Women's Army Corps or the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, as they were to, to start off with. Um, these young ladies were established, this was established in 1942, um, quite late on compared to the other organisations when the government, real, the American government realised that they were going to need a lot of non-combat roles um, to support their troops during, during the Second World War. Um, so they were the equivalent to us, our British ATS or the WAF sort of combined the two. Obviously, the Americans at that point didn't have a separate air force. So the, the WAC were doing the job of both the RATS and the WAF were doing separately. Um, similar roles, similar rank structures as well that these women had. Um, but obviously, these girls were asked to volunteer. They, they weren't conscripted like the men were to join the army. Um, and their recruitment drive early on was really successful. They managed to get 35,000 within the first six months, which is quite impressive. But as the other branches started to pop up in, the, in America, you know, the Women's Marine Corps Reserve, the waves and things like that, they started to offer better pay. And something that also came to play was nicer uniforms. Mm. Um, the, you know, you, you know, they'd see all these lovely posters. and You go, well, I like that uniform, so I'll go for that one, if you know what I mean. And if it's more money, that's even better. So after that, the, the, it's hard to make khaki, or, 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 you know, look look good, isn't it? That Everyone yeah, always says yeah. the Navy, when you get black and white and Navy, it just yeah. seems to look better yeah. than khaki drab is hard to make kind of exactly attractive. exactly so you know when things like the waves and stuff come along they were just pouring into doing that because they had these beautiful uniforms whereas these poor wax um drowned in od was um you know yeah. slightly less desirable um but you know they managed to they managed to keep it going um and they managed to recruit quite a lot um so to join the Women's Army Corps, you had to be the age um, between 21 and 50. You had to have no children under the age of 14 and you had to have at least two years of high school education. So, you know, quite you know, low standards coming in on this one. Um, you know, they weren't asking too much of these girls because they really needed people to join up. And if they set the bar too high, they weren't going to get enough enough women to come in. Um, but once they passed those entry requirements, as long as they were fit enough, they'd enter um, five weeks of, of basic training. So similar to the Army Nurse Corps, um, the first few weeks would be very, very similar. Just basic military organisation drill. They'd have all their health checks, their vaccinations and things like that. And they'd get issued their first uniforms. So, you know. They then, as, as they moved on in their training, they'd start to do things like map reading, a few sort of route marches and things, preparing them for life in the military. Um, and obviously things like bed making and all of that and kit inspections and stuff like that, you know, slowly introducing. They were very good at it, though, They, you know, with the Women's Army Corps. They did it gradually. It wasn't, a, you know, they weren't thrown into it from, you know, being screamed at like, the young men were they weren't you know getting a drill sergeant shouting down the neck when they first arrived they were very gentle with them they brought them into it gently so it wasn't too much of a shock and they didn't get everyone dropping out within the first half an hour of being there so here we are mate having their being shown how to make a bed correctly so a lot of the girls weren't used to the physical activity. A lot of these women were housewives and not really, you know, they weren't really exercising or anything. You know, they spent their days at home cooking, cleaning, doing all the housewife stuff, maybe looking after children. So they built in the physical activity very gradually and they had quite a comprehensive physical training programme. 
So, you know, they, they built their strength up slowly. They didn't want to wear them out too quickly. They wanted to do it gradually so that um, they could become acclimatised to, to the physical um, demands of the job. And then their final weeks, they'd be taught um, a little bit of survival in, in war zones. Um, again, the basic defence against gas attacks and things like that, a little bit of, of self-defence. Um, and then after that, those five weeks of basic training, they then have to undertake a um, aptitude test. So, you know, a bit like we do with our military today, you take a bit of a test and they see what level you're at. Um, and that would then help them to determine what role they could then go on after this they could then go on to specialize there's so many different roles which we'll cover in a moment um and these tests could sort of group them into you know well they'd be more suited to that role or, or this role so and, and once they'd done that they'd be then sent for a further six weeks of training in their new role that they were assigned to they might be given one or two roles to choose from um and they'd then go off and, and whatever role they were then given they would then go off and do six weeks to learn how to do that job um, so just go a few a few of the roles that that they could have had. Um, this isn't an exhaustive list, so there was much more jobs than I've got here. But just to give you a, a range of the jobs that these girls might have had. Um, so you could have been an accountant, a baker, a bookkeeper, a camera technician, a cashier. Um, you could have been a chauffeur, a draftsman, a librarian, um, machine record operation, medical technician, med messenger mimograph operator, musician, uh, photo lab technician, postal clerk, radio operator, sales clerk, secretary, statistician, stenographer, telephone operator, typist, weather operator, and, and you know, the list goes yeah, on. You know, they just gone into, and it's amazing because, so, like I said, so many of these girls would have just been housewives or, you know, doing a little, maybe a job in a local shop or something like that. And they were suddenly being trained to do these really quite complex tasks. Um, and, it, you know, it'd be a benefit, you know, to go from, you know, complete, you know, you wouldn't have imagined in a million years that you could train to do a job like this. So to be given the opportunity was fantastic for these young ladies. Um, and once their training was complete, um, they'd be given the opportunity, you know, does anyone want to go? If you want to go overseas, put your name down and then we'll, you know, consider you to go overseas and serve overseas. Um, but unlike the Army Nurse Corps and the Red Cross, the WACs only served in the European and North African theatres. They didn't go anywhere else. Um, a majority of them stayed in America. Um, but like, you know, we had a few come over here to into the European theatre and, and a handful over into the African theatre as well. So the first unit of WACs that arrived here in the UK, um, it was the first battalion um, of WAC detachment. There's around 500 of them and they arrived in the UK in February 1943. Um, they had did the standard eight day crossing of the Atlantic with a load of men. Um, but these this very first group of WACs to arrive in England were assigned to the 8th Air Force so that the whole lot of them, when they arrived, they were they were given to the 8th Air Force um, and that's where they were needed the most because at this point it was too early to, for the build-up of D-Day. So where the most work was needed was is, is in the 8th Air Force. You know, 1943 was a horrific year for the 8th Air Force. Um, you know, that was when it was at its worst, really. So this is when they needed all those supportive roles the most. So when they first arrived, they were sent to Stone in Staffordshire, um, where they were then subdivided into detachments and units. Obviously, the 8th Air Force is the big, um, big umbrella of it all, but obviously there was a lot of smaller units that, that went under that. So after eight days in Staffordshire, um, they were sent their separate ways to the various 8th Air Force headquarters located here in East Anglia. Um, so a few, you know, it could have been the 1st Air Division headquarters at Brampton Grange in Cambridgeshire, um, 2nd Air Division at Ketteringham Hall in Norfolk, 3rd Air Division at Elvedon Hall here in Suffolk, or um, you've got the 8th Air Force headquarters quarters at High, High Wycombe, um, 9th Bomber Command at Earls, Earls Cone in Essex, um, and you've also got the 8th Fighter Command at Bushy Hall and, and the 8th Service Command at Milton Ernest as well. So, you know, there was quite a few places these young ladies could have gone. But again, common misconception, they weren't sent to work on individual bases. Right. It's what makes it really confusing is when these bases were built, you've all got the, you know, you've got the airfield plan of, of a base and there's always in the accommodation, you've got the WAF section and people forget these, these plans were made to RAF standards. So that's where WAFs would be. 
not American wax, so it changed. Right. And I know for certain on you know my close air you know, my airfield here in Framlingham, the the WAF section was actually home to the MP company of of the um, 390th. So you know even though those plans say it doesn't mean that there were women there. These women only worked in these big headquarters um, dotted around. They might have been on bases to do jobs um, that you know their job for a day. They travel around you know occasionally but they weren't actually based on an airfield they they were in these headquarters um, have a question about pay about whether they got the equivalent pay of the men or whether they got less or how it was structured so um i don't know exact figures but i know it was considerably less than the men yeah, I, um, I knew that was going to be the answer <laughs> yeah yeah, considerably less than than a boy. You know, there wasn't. It wasn't like, well, it, this is the pay bracket for a sergeant, regardless of sex. It was like, well, if you, you know, male sergeant was up here, female sergeant was sort of down here somewhere. Yeah. Um, and it's the same for nurses. Got less pay than a, you know your standard army officer. Um, so yeah, un unfortunately, that the pay was was considerably less of that than, than the men that they were working alongside. Um. So the wax that were sent here to work with the 8th Air Force, they were mainly trained in clerical supportive sort of strict roles that would work well alongside this this massive bombing um, strategic bombing command that, that they'd um, formed here in the UK. Um, so the roles that weren't needed most, like, like I said, librarians, that kind of things and stuff like that they stayed back in the states it was only those girls with the roles that were going to be absolutely vital that they brought over here to work work with the eighth air force so unlike the nurses who were doing their 12-hour days the wax had a shorter working day and um, they do more of your typical hours maybe eight till five eight till six something like that so they had a little bit more free time on their hands than the nurses you know at the end of the working day they weren't going to just collapse in their bed and go to sleep they were these girls were much more likely to go out and do stuff um and you know being a majority of them being enlisted as well rather than officers there was a lot more boys to hang around with as well you know there was a lot more enlisted men to go around with and you know go for bike rides or go for a walk with after work or whatever um so you were more likely to see a whack wandering around um out of hours than you were than you were a nurse or a member of the red cross so and and that being said that led to the only marriage of an american female in britain to a british civilian and um, there was only one recorded um and that was to a sergeant jane freitag who was working at the second air division headquarters near norwich um, and she married a young man called thomas thompson of great yarmouth whose father was an mp at the time and they got married in norwich um, i'm yet to find any more but as far as i know that is the only marriage of an american female service woman to a british civilian so you know that you know it just goes to show you you think about the amount of american men that marry you know the civilian females here in england you know massive numbers of it yeah, you know yeah. so it just goes to show that it was much much less likely um for them to be around um, but there was much fewer wax in the UK. Um, there was quite a low number of them. It was about 4,700 recorded in the UK um, in 1944, with quite a majority of those being sent straight over into mainland Europe after the Normandy invasion. Um, and in the sort of later part of 1944, quite a lot moved over into, into sort of France and Belgium, leaving only those wax here with the 8th Air Force, leaving only them behind. So it was only the wax with the 8th Air Force that stayed here for the duration. Um, but that meant that, you know, even though you were more likely to see a whack hanging around. Um, again, it didn't stick in anybody's mind. You, whenever I ask a male veteran of the 8th Air Force or something, do you remember seeing them? The Answer is always no. Don't remember seeing mm. any of them at all. Um, the, Brit the British civ civilian population at the time, you know, one olive drab uniform merged into another. You wouldn't have batted an eyelid if another female walked past you in OD, easily mistaken for a member of the ATS. You wouldn't take in a mental note of, oh, well, that was an American service woman because you didn't. Um, so, you know, it wasn't something that, that was taken note of a lot. So, again, you know, it's one of those things that's just gone completely unmentioned for so long. Um, 
here we can see some of the wax out on a on a jolly you know, these two young ladies actually did a pub crawl um, around St Neots and there's actually a whole series of photos of these two young ladies outside the various pubs in St Neots um but the girls that did stay made a massive impression on the men that they worked alongside the, you know the the air crews thought a hell of a lot of these wax and the jobs that they were doing um particularly at Kesheringham Hall they were right on the edge of um Hethel airfield just outside Norwich um, and they actually so much so the girls you know on at Kettering and made such an impact they actually made a uh, name one of their liberators after um the the main goddess that um the wax based themselves on so we can see here that the christening ceremony of said liberator um over over at Hethel airfield um, and again, that's that same second air division of wax head, at, the, at the headquarters there. They were also invited to take part in the VE Day celebrations in Norwich alongside many members. There was a lot of men from the various bases low, close by of the 8th Air Force. But um, this contingent of wax also took part in that parade. And this is them entering um, the gates in front of Norwich Cathedral for, for that celebration. So last but by no means least um, is the American Red Cross. This is a, a personal favourite of mine um, just because of the, the, sh the sheer connection they had with the 8th Air Force. And that's what I love the most. Um, so this is something that I've spent a huge amount of time researching. This is one that I love. You know, this is something, you know, when I've seen photos, you know, you, you know, they're the ones you quite often see alongside the, the men of the 8th Air Force. Um, so the these um, the American Red Cross was formed in 1881, um, very similar to the organisations that were already formed at that point, like the British Red Cross. It was formed by Clara Barton, um, and she set it up having seen firsthand the work of the, of the British Red Cross and the, and the sort of French Red Cross and things like that. Um, and it's slightly different in the two that we just looked at, the other two obviously being part of the US Army, but this is obviously a civilian organisation. So they weren't actually part of the military, but they worked very, very closely with the military at that point in time. Um, and they did supportive roles along, alongside the, the, the American Army. So at the outbreak of the Second World War in 1939, um, the American Red Cross jumped in and sent a, a massive cash grant to the UK of, of, I think it was about two million or something like that, um, to aid in civilian welfare um, and to help our sort of, sort of civilian defence and things like that. And they were very quick. They actually sent over groups of um, nursing staff that they had um, to set up specialist hospitals here in the UK during the Blitz. And um, the two young ladies here were part of the Harvard unit, which set up a specialist hospital to care for wounded children of the Blitz and also study um, very strangely they also studied the outbreak of viruses that were bred among people in the close conditions of air raid shelters as well and um, so they did viral studies of that as well quite um uniquely um so after the attack on pearl harbor um you know millions of americans turned to the red cross in order to train in civil defense roles um and they also assisted in the recruitment as i mentioned earlier for the nurses to join the army and the navy um but nursing wasn't their main task um whenever i'm wearing one of my red cross uniforms people just immediately assume that it's a nurse they see that red cross and the first thing you think is medical um but actually nursing wasn't their main task um their main task was military welfare um, and so with that set up a, a whole new organization of, of military welfare service and that that's what it came under um they started their recruitment drive for this particular service in 1942 when when america joined the war and they managed to select at the, at the very start, they had six and a half million um, volunteers already on their books. And out of that six and a half million, they managed to select 7,000 to undergo the very first um, of, the, of the training programs that they set up under the Military Welfare Service. Um, so they would be sent to Washington to undergo this first phase of training. Um, you know, no, no one else had had this training before. So they were sort of the, the test dummies on it, if, if you like. Um, so they were their priority was to assist the military um, and in, in a supportive role. So 
the entry requirements for the Red Cross were quite strict. Um, they were really picky on the ladies that, that they were going to select for this role. Um, and in order to join the military welfare service, you had to be 25 or over. You had to be single. You had to have either a college or a university degree. Um, and you also had to provide quite a few references, both personal and um, you know, from previous jobs that you've had as well. And they also had to pass various exams in order to be selected. And it was, I think the, the statistic is only one in 10 got through this initial selection process. So they were really quite picky in who they were going to have to join this particular um, branch of service. So if they managed to pass that selection process, they'd go on to do their six weeks training um, at Washington, D.C., where they'd learn a few sort of bits, basic military structure, accounting um, staff management and more importantly, entertaining skills as well. Um, learn how to make a cup of coffee and make it en masse and things like that. Um, once their training was complete, again, similar to the wax and the nurses, they were then asked if anyone wanted to go and work overseas. And obviously a huge number did. That was the main draw of the job. You know, you, you joined up to go overseas. You didn't want to stay. You wanted to go where, where the action was. I'll move to the next one. Um, so, you know, there was a few roles within within the America within this sort of military welfare service in the Red Cross. Um, they were sort of branched out into a few different areas to make sure that they covered all aspects in supporting the the, the boys in the fight. Um, so they first arrived in the UK in forty two, like like the um, nurses did, and they were here with the very first troop. So they were, you know, the minute the first boys arrived, these girls were there as well. And um, they were there from the very start. They didn't, you know, like the wax, they weren't there for a good sort of 12, 15 months after the boys arrived. These young ladies were here right from the very start. So I've said there's a few roles they could have had. Um, so the first one they could be assigned to is um, work in the service clubs, area clubs, camp clubs, whatever you want to call them. Um, and these were all set up. So you'd have a service clubs were set up in any large towns and cities. We, you know, everyone knows of the Rainbow Club in London um, being the most famous one of them all. But, you know, most towns and cities had at least one. Um, so you'd have one of them and then you also um had the aero clubs on every air base so every air base will have had an american red cross aero club and you know these were equipped with um a, a snack bar and a cafe type area they'd have a lounge they'd have pool tables table tennis tables reading rooms libraries i almost sort of class it as a bit of a, a youth club or something like that you know somewhere for them to go in there somewhere for the these boys to go in their free time and just relax, get a little bit of slice of home, listen to some records, chat to an American girl um, and just have, have a coffee and a, and a chocolate bar or something like that, just to just to put their feet up. Um, but the towns, the clubs in the towns, the service clubs, they also provided um, accommodation as well. So a lot of men on leave for more, for more than a day were going to be looking for somewhere to stay. So those clubs in towns also provided that for them at a very small, for a very small fee. Um, and they were able to do that, you know, just turn up. You didn't have to pre-book. You just turned up and said, I need a bed for tonight or the next two nights and, and you'd get it as well as food. Um and the first one of those to open was actually the Eagle Club, and that opened in May of 42 in London. Um, so that was the first one to open. And at its peak in um, 1944, there was around 365 um, service clubs in the UK. So, you know, there's quite a few. Um, and like I say, you've got the area clubs. And then on the sort of smaller, like less permanent places, you had either a camp club or a donut dugout, uh, sort of on the on these smaller bases, particularly in the lead up to D-Day, when you've got these huge camps down on the south coast that were only there for two, three, four weeks. You'd have a very temporary establishment set up in one of those as well. Now, the other one, as we can see here, the other uh, thing they could have been sent to work on is the famous club mobile. Um, so these were service clubs on wheels, like I've just said. Um, and these were to support those men. So you can see here at ground crews. Um, obviously, these poor ground crews had very little free time to go and enjoy the aero club on base. So um, as soon as the Red Cross realised this, they said, right, well, we'll bring the club to them. These guys that can't enjoy the clubs, 
we'll bring it to them while they're at work. So, and that's when they came up with the with the club mobile in early, uh, sort of late 42, early 43. Um, these would serve coffee, donuts, they'd have gum and cigarettes and magazines on hand to hand out to them. Um, but as well as a sort of the main kitchen area and the serving hatch and stuff, you see at the back of these club mobiles as well you had a lounge area um so we can see some members of the eighth air force here enjoying um th this lounge area with books and records somewhere just to have a five minutes peace and quiet away from away from the mob of men that you know they've been hanging around with um so you know they were it was a, quite a big vehicle they had the ones that operated with the eighth air force they used old london green line coaches obviously second world war no one was going to go on their coach holidays to the seaside so they um these coaches were rendered useless so the american red cross bought these coaches and converted them into these club mobiles um and they became quite a symbol um for especially the Eighth Air Force, they saw these huge great grey buses of pull up on base, being pale grey. They stood out from everything else around them that was olive drab, and a lot of the boys, the minute they saw them, you know, they'd be up on their feet running towards it because they knew that they were going to get be greeted with an American girl and a free coffee and donut. Um, just, to, just to jump in, it's just we had the discussion. I think it was with Philip last night about. You know, when these pilots come back and they're having to go through debriefing and things like that, there's a very military environment of people wanting to know data. You've got to give you, and the yeah. same for the air crew, the, the ground crews are on constant jobs to get the, the 50 cal rounds um, into the belts and the air, with, with aircraft repaired. It must have been really nice to just have a sense, a touch of home, just uh, the, the yeah. young lady kind of just not in your face demanding stuff of you in fact they're doing the reverse they're giving themselves yeah. to you they're giving you a donut they're giving you a few seconds of time it must have been a real yeah. psychological boost as well as just the actual yeah. physical donut yeah exactly exactly so you know they'd be serving quite often they pull up you know late morning lunch time ish before the the whole the you know to the, that day's raid would return back to base so ground crew would get their fill first you know they'd be first in for coffee and donuts while they sweated out but the other ones the air crews coming back and then the minute these air crews arrived they'd go you know they'd be greeted with a coffee and, and a snack before they went to debriefing so it, take that in with you you know you need a coffee kind of thing you know take that in with you and just take five minutes kind of thing so that was you know that really was these boys really valued this service that the american red cross provided um you know just to the first thing you you, you know when you see them get off the first thing they do is have a fag and grab a coffee because you know in any stressful situation most people turn to tea or coffee um so you know this was something that they could have and it was free of charge as well yeah so yeah, so these club mobiles would be staffed by three girls. Um, occasionally, you see them actually staffed. There'd be two American women and one British volunteer in the early days when numbers were slightly lower. Um, and particularly these green line coaches um, were driven by British drivers as well. So the, the coach drivers that would have driven these buses in peacetime were suddenly out of a job. Um, so were employed by the American Red Cross to drive these buses around the bases. Um, these young ladies will, won't, didn't live on base. Um, these young ladies stayed um, in a central location in a hotel or a stately home. They'd be given a certain area, so a certain group of bases to work with for a number of weeks. They'd make their way around those bases for a few weeks and then they'd be given their next assignment onto the next base um, or group of bases that they were to work on. So they'd go back each night, they'd drive to and fro, they'd go between bases. They'd usually do more than one base in a day. They may, might do one or maybe two bases in a day um, and then go back. And then they were up early the next morning um, to, to do it all over again. Um, so these girls were always on the move. Um, a lot of them were sent over again, like they all did. A lot of these girls were sent into mainland Europe after the Normandy invasion. Um, and again, left only those serving in East Anglia to the um, 8th Air Force, left only those girls doing that job here in the UK. Because at that point, everyone else had gone over in, onto the continent. 
so yeah so that was their that was their main role um they drive around i've heard a couple of stories um these club mobiles were fitted in the kitchens with donut making machines so they'd be taught in their training how to make these donuts with this equipment but they were renowned for breaking down so a lot of the girls gave up on that quite quickly and we would employ local people to do that for them early in the morning before they headed mm. out so actually all they had to do was get the cooked donuts on board and go out and serve them they didn't have to worry about trying to make them a lot of the girls also found that if they arrived and they've got boys waiting they'd all want to pile in the bus and help they wanted to help and they'd get in the way and you know you can imagine it there's so many photos of these buses filled with men trying to help in making donuts or wash up or whatever you know it, it, it just went to carnage they said well what we'll do is if we go with it already we can just serve it and then and then go kind of thing we don't need to have the whole rigmarole of trying to make it while we've got 50 yeah. men in a queue waiting for it wanting to know how long it's going to be and everything else so they were quite they were quite clever so we'd employ local people at four o'clock in the morning was, to make... was working with the wvs uh, uh common because yes. my grandmother was in the wvs and she definitely was involved in i think making pancakes for the uh for yep. For for the whatever base it was near her, I think that would have been Bulma somewhere near there. So so yeah. was that normal? It was, yes. Yeah. So the the WVS worked very very closely with the American Red Cross. Um, a lot of these service clubs would only be run by a handful of American women. If you're on a in an aero club on a base, it would only be two young women, American women. The rest would be local um, staffed by local people, and a lot of those women will have been members of the of the women's voluntary service. Um, so they would be, you know, the Women's Voluntary Service would give the Red Cross the names of local women and say, here we go. These are the local volunteers. You can use them. You can employ them to work. Um, and before the Red Cross was even here, the WVS had their welcome clubs that they set right. up before the Red Cross was even here. So, you know, they were doing that job of the Red Cross before they'd even arrived. Um, so, yeah, the WVS played a huge role in assisting the American Red Cross in their work. Definitely. Thank you. So. The other role um, that they could have gone into is working in the flak houses. Um, obviously, this is something quite unique to the Army Air Forces of the time. Um, I don't think the RAF had anything similar to it. So these were the stately houses bought by the Air Ministry um, in, in those early days of 43, when, you know, sort of late 42, early 43, when the Eighth Air Force was suffering massive losses. Um, and they were making that connection between the mental health of their flyers and the quality of flying they noticed that the you know the worse these guys felt the worse the quality of flying was going to be so they just gave the job to the american red cross and said right what we want to do is set up these rest homes for flyers this is you know this isn't something we offer them this you know they have to do this so um when they reach halfway, any flyer, once they reach halfway in their mission quota, whether that be 25, 30, 35, once they reach that halfway point, they'd be given seven days in one of these flat houses. It wasn't something they were awarded if they started to show mental ill health. Everyone did it, regardless of whether they were OK or not. Um, so they get this seven days rest in one of these flak houses um, and because they wanted to take them away from the military environment these men were used to they gave the role to the american red cross to do it because they were a civilian organization they weren't part of the military um so they like i said they were set up in large country houses um, that had been requisitioned by the air ministry and they'd be run by around four red cross girls they would then employ a large number of civilians to work in these in these flat houses in the kitchens as house staff and things like that um and upon arrival the boys would be have their rank taken off them and um, they were to use first name terms only with everybody so there was no rank there was no surnames really stripped them away from the military environment they'd been used to they were given other clothes to wear so they weren't in uniform all the time um to really just take them away from that military environment really give them time to clear their minds make them feel at home give them chance to relax and in the in the in these stately homes, um, they'd have a private room with a proper bed with nice sheets, you know, away from green blankets and, you know, not a lot else. 
um, with heating and they'd have a bath to, you know, at their disposal. Um, and they also then were given numerous activities that they could take part in. And um, we can see here them taking part in some clay pigeon shooting. They could go for bike rides. They could go horse riding, rambling. Um, they also had um, games rooms in a lot of these places. They'd hold regular dances. They'd go on trips to local attractions and um, beauty spots. So, you know, there was a lot of all the sorts of things that... Um, you know, they wouldn't get a chance to do on base. And what's also interesting is a lot of these um, flat houses are set up quite a long way from East Anglia, so a long way from um, the fields of the 8th. So they weren't greeted every morning by the hum of engines like they were normally. Mm. Um, you know, they could wake up in the morning and hear the birds. It was nice and quiet. You know, it was away from that um, sort of humdrum of, of the airfield. So they were quite keen to take them completely away from that environment they'd been used to. There were a few unofficial um, flat houses. I know that there was one on the Norfolk Broads um, and there was one at Great Yarmouth, I think. And they were, they've always gone as unofficial ones because they were still quite close to those airfields and you would have still heard the aircraft and seen the men in uniform. So it wasn't a complete break, but it was still somewhere for them to go um, and have a few days out. They'd enjoy, they'd get three hot meals a day as well. Um, and they'd have army nutritionists um, designing those meals to make sure that they were getting on these seven days, they were getting all the nutrients they need away from mess hall dinners. They were getting, you know, really healthy meals to help build them up. Um, and they'd also have doctors on hand 24 seven as well to treat any physical or mental ailments that any of these guys might be suffering while they were here. Um, and they did a an amazing job that it really they really did work get giving them that break that they needed halfway through proved with fantastic results um and you know those in charge you know to his spats and all of that they really 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 valued this service that the american red cross offered to their flyers um and by the end of their three years um around eighty seven thousand airmen had passed through one of these flak houses so a huge number of men if they made it to that halfway point they got the chance to to have a break for a little while and the final role that they could be given was hospital work. Um, like I said, the, the main role of the American Red Cross at that point wasn't nursing. Um, so those these young ladies working in hospitals were not nurses. Um, they would be here to um, provide welfare. Again, this a similar thing, just welfare to both the patients and the staff. Um, staff weren't forgotten in that thing. So um, these young ladies, they'd have a very small service club set up at the hospitals um you know for ambulatory patients to attend as well as staff and they'd also do rounds on the wards they'd go round on the wards they'd a bit like a, a mini club mobile they would hand out cigarettes and candy and gum and they'd have books for them to read um and they'd also go round and you know if you know, a lot of a lot of these boys in hospital with such awful injuries they couldn't write home to say what had happened to them they were unable to do that so these girls would do it for them they'd sit down with them help them write a letter home whether they do it for them or help them write it um they'd read any letters that they had received that they can't read themselves but really doing all the jobs that nurses would have loved to have done, but didn't have time to do. Um, so all these extra roles um, that the you know, nurse didn't have time to sit and help them write letters home. Mm. So that's what the, these young ladies did. And again, that was something really popular in the in these bigger um, hospitals serving, serving the 8th Air Force that we've talked about. So... When you think about it, these roles are relatively simple. All of the ones I've talked about, a service club, a lot of it revolves around serving or what you think revolves around serving coffee and donuts, just making them smile, things like that. So it did beg the question to me when I first started looking at it. So why do these girls have to be so much older? Why do they have to be so highly educated as well to do what seems like a relatively simple task? You know, compared to what the WACs were doing, this is like pathetic really but as you get as i've been researching it in the years i really now know why they why they had to be so highly educated um you know so 
to start off with these the Red Cross girls, those that worked on the air bases, um, these would be unlike the WAC and everything else. I've said they were not on the bases. The American Red Cross, they would be the the two girls that ran the club would be the only two girls on an eighth Air Force base. They would live on the base. So we're talking about two girls compared to two and a half, three thousand men on these bases. You had to have your head screwed on to cope mm. with that. There was no MPs to guard you here like there was on the ships. You had to have your head screwed on because you were the most wanted woman on that base. Um, you know, it was they had to really know that know what they were doing. And that was why they made them, that was the reason why they made them 25 or older, because at that point in time, your typical airman was between the ages of 18 and 22. If you were 25, it made you off limits to a majority of the men on the base. They wouldn't, they wouldn't have been that interested. Um, and they were there then to provide a motherly role or a big sister role at that point in time. So they weren't seen in a girlfriend form. They were seen more as a mum or a big sister. Um, Obviously, I didn't rule it out. A lot of the officers were their age or older, so they still got married to officers and everything else. But it made them off limits to the majority. Um, and the service clubs and the flat houses were also run like small businesses. Um, you know, it's as well as, you know, that you were the only two girls, you'd have to employ civilian staff, you'd have to actively interview them, seek them out. And um, you had to do all the accounts, all the paperwork that came with it, dealing with all the rations. And um, obviously, being in England at the time, they were entitled to food rations. So they had to sort all of that out. A lot of them, are, when they arrived here in England, the the clubs didn't exist they were sent in and they had to they were given an empty building and told to turn it into this fantastic establishment that men are going to really want to go to um so they had to do that as well um and obviously you know that's no mean feat running running that on your own with one other woman um so again another reason why they had to have these qualifications and life experience compared to the others um here we can see a group. These are some of the local civilian workers of, a, of an aero club on an 8th Air Force base. So they're all wearing a sort of Red Cross overalls over the top of their civilian clothing. That gives you the idea of the sort of people that they're employing. And like, like we said about the WVS, that all the women in this photo were most likely volunteers of the WVS as well. Um, but the real objective of the American Red Cross was mental health. Um, this wasn't put across to, to the girls in their training when they were in Washington. They weren't told that your main role here is is to, you know, maintain the mental health of these young men. That, you know, because it would, one, probably have frightened them off. And two, mental health was still such a taboo subject. Um, so, you know, they, they didn't like to think about that side of things. But, but that was their real role. Mental health was what they were there for. Um, you know, they were dealing with the girls in the clubs and the club mobiles, a handful of girls compared to thousands of young men. And these young men needed someone to offload on, you know, they if they could, they wanted to offload onto onto their mum or to their sister, someone who was going to listen, and you know, provide no feedback on it whatsoever. They just just someone to listen to them. Um, and they had to these young ladies would hear all the stories, what they'd been through, what they'd seen that day. Um, you know, men that had lost friends and even things like when they'd had letters home and they got the Dear John letter from the girlfriend back home, you know, things like that. Or, you know, mum was sick back in the States and, you know, you can't get home to be there with her and things like that. So things like that, as well as everything that came with with being um, a flyer in the 8th Air Force. Um, and these girls had to listen to these stories. They just had to absorb it and carry on. They didn't have, they then didn't have anyone to then go and talk to about it. They were just expected to take this information on board and carry on. I know um, one of the Red Cross workers at Thorpe Abbott's, um, she stayed up all night with one of the pilots. Um, obviously that, that Schweinfurt raid in December of 43, 13 of the 100th bomb group went out and only three came back. Um, she spent all night with one of those pilots that was one of the three that returned and he literally paced the floorboards with him until he cried himself to exhaustion and collapsed. And she was on her own with him at this point. So she, you know, his crew members came and found her and said, look, he's in this state. Can you come and talk to him? Because he doesn't want any of us to be with him. Um, and she literally just paced the floorboards with him until he 
cried himself and questioned why he was the only one to return out of 13, you know, why he was the only one out of three pilots to return. Um, he had so much guilt, the things he'd seen and everything else, you know. And she did that. She she spent all night with him while he cried. She then carried him back to his Nissan hut and put him to bed. She didn't have anyone to help her do that. She literally dragged him back, put him to bed. She went to bed herself, had two hours sleep, got up and then carried on with the next day as if nothing had happened. And this is just one story of thousands of these, these young women that, you know, they had to witness these things. I've heard stories of them witnessing the horrific crashes when they watch them returning back to, back to base after missions and seeing these aircraft returning in horrific conditions, watching wounded being unloaded. And then, you know, these young men then flooding to them to offload what they'd seen, what they'd heard, what they'd experienced to them as well. You you can't imagine what that was like to in intake all of that information and deal with it and be that shoulder to cry on. But mm. then you hadn't got a shoulder to cry on afterwards once you'd heard all of that. You know, they cared so much about these young men. Um, they were all of them were like their little brothers, you know, and then to see them so upset, so broken was heartbreaking for these young ladies. So, you know, I think that and that's the reason why they had to be so much older. They had to ha be quite hard headed to to do that job, um, you know, and it, it, it is sad when you think about it. Um, you know, I couldn't imagine going through that and seeing that and putting up with that on a daily basis, there's no way I'd be able to manage it. You know, if I see one man cry, that's it. But seeing multiple in a day would, would break me without a doubt. And I'm thinking that the, the word that you've used, and it came up previously in the week, the donut dollies words doesn't really in any way convey Do what that justice. job involves. I mean, it's no. that, that's the, the physical act of actually handing someone a, a, a donut. But this, this, yeah. this job of unpaid untrained psychotherapist psychiatric nurse mother and let me remind ourselves again that this whole concept of men going into incredible action for a few hours and then coming back to relative peace and then going in and out of it when we did a show with mary lou roberts last week about you know the infantry and the fox cells in in, in europe they're, they're on yeah. they're in danger all the time and and how that's one set of problems, but being in incredible danger as these crews are for a few hours or, or, or many hours, and then back into going to the pub and being able to have time to think about your your mortality, especially if the weather's bad for a few days. You yeah. know, you know that you're going to have to take off again. That yeah. that and contradiction of, of experience was was new. Um, yeah, yeah, and exactly. Girl having to deal with this new phenomenon, it's amazing. Yeah, exactly. I, I really avoid the, the term donut dolly. It's something I really don't like because it's quite derogatory to the to the roles these young ladies did. I just take my hat off to them. Like I said, there's no yeah. way I'd have been able to do that at, at my age. I'm 28. And to think I'd be sent off to somewhere thousands of miles away to do that job, I just wouldn't be able to do it. So, you know, it, it's really amazing. Um, so to round up, we consider the roles these young ladies had. Um, all of them equally as important as the other. They all did an amazing things. Um, so why have they been so forgotten? Why has this whole story to, you know, this piece of the story, the Eighth Air Force, it's gone completely unmentioned. You know, you might hear people say, oh, yeah, a nurse or or a whack. But it would be, you know, people know very little about it. And, you know, you, pit, you know, rumours start, like I said, about the nurses on bases and things like that. Um, there's so little information out there for people to access on these women um, and the jobs that they did. Um, so I think, you know, I've got my own theory as to why it's gone forgotten. There, obviously, there isn't an answer to it, but there's a few things that play into it. I think you've got to think about um, the length of time these women were working in a day. Like you said, the air crews, when they weren't flying, they could have, you know, disappeared off base for a few hours or whatever if they'd managed to get themselves a pass um so when these girls did go out um they very rarely socialized with locals um they tend to stick keep themselves to themselves they hang out with fellow american service women they were much quieter um you know they they were here by choice so you know these young men were drafted 
into this and, and conscripted into this um and were doing a very dangerous job and quite rightly so lived every day like it was their last and that would be much more memorable to witness as a local person or as a fellow um, serviceman in, in the UK at that point in time than a group of maybe four girls in a pub very quietly having a drink. You wouldn't have noticed it. You wouldn't have gone, oh, that's memorable. Um, you know, it, you wouldn't have even probably noticed they were even there. Uh, and there um, is a sea of women in uniform in the UK generally, isn't it? I mean, one of the things that, you know, when we yeah. found out that there were more women in the UK serving in some kind of uniform role than there yeah. were men because it's yeah. you know, the, the, the bus drivers and the ammunition workers. And so so yeah. seeing women in uniform, you in said earlier, you, you were not necessarily going to distinguish no. is that person a factory worker no. or WVS exactly. or WAC. It's just everybody so many people were in some type type of khaki so that with the numbers you know seventeen thousand women in, in, in the nurses you're going to blend in these these red cross yeah. girls they're going to just be lost in a crowd yeah exactly yeah. so i think that's one of the reasons um why they've gone so unmentioned for all these years um because like no what no one remembers them um i've spoken to veterans of the eighth air force i've known many over the years of doing this and I've asked every single one of them. They go, well, I, I, I went in the clubs, but I can't say I really remembered the women that worked there. Um, one one veteran I know even played um, table tennis for the American Red Cross, and he still doesn't even remember the girls that worked there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it just goes to show that they were just doing a job. They blended in with everybody else. There was nothing, you know, they weren't loud or boisterous or having out to have fun constantly. You know, it, they have just literally just dissolved into the background, essentially. Um, and also, um, you know, when they got home um, from the war, these men were greeted as heroes. You know, they had a hero's welcome bands waiting for them in New York or wherever they, wherever they were returning to. But again, these women's just dissolved into the background. They literally, they got home. It's like, right, back to your job before whatever you're doing, back to being a housewife, back to being a mother, whatever they did beforehand. There was no hero's welcome for these young ladies. No one was interested in hearing their story about what they did during the war. Um, you know, it was like, well, yeah, well, whatever, but we want to listen to his story. He, you know, what he did was really impressive and everything else. Your story's nothing compared to what the boys could do. Um, and it was like that for a very long time. And in the 1940s and the 1950s, it was really in 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 all um sort of societies, in British and American society, it was really frowned upon for women to join the military it was really seen as something women should not do it was a man's job to do it was a man's place in war women should have no part in that whatsoever so the minute they came home they were thrown back into civilian life and forgotten about and it's been like that for a very long time um so again their stories didn't come out a lot of people don't know a lot of the people i know whose mothers served here didn't know what their mother did until after they died until they were sorting through their stuff and found all of this and gone why have i never known this she's never spoken about it she's never reminisced about it she kept quiet completely um so and i think you know between those two i think that's why this has gone so untold for so long yeah. because it wasn't spoken about after the war it was completely brushed under the carpet move on kind of thing um and they didn't make them anything for themselves they didn't you know go out to be remembered or anything else um but did they Susan, know, did they have the same uh rights to the gi bill or things like that as, yeah. as the men if yeah, they yeah. So they had to wait to return home just like the men did. A lot of the girls didn't get home till 46. Um, some of them stayed a lot longer. American Red Cross certainly stayed in England and in Europe for a lot, you know, well after the GIs had returned home. Um, some stayed um, into the German occupation and carried on right through for quite a long time um, after the Second World War. Um, and a lot of Red Cross workers here in the UK that were with the 8th Air Force, once the 8th Air Force had all returned home, um, they then ran the... Um, like the GI bride camps, these camps that were set up for all these women waiting to go overseas to meet their new husbands. Um, and they ran those camps. The American Red Cross ran those camps of women that had to wait and go overseas um, once there was space on ships to, to get them over there. 
Um, so yeah, they were they didn't get priority to go home at all. They were made to wait with everybody else, you know, until your space came up, you waited. Um, and again, you know, all these men were still hanging around again for months and months and months and months in, in these camps, um, waiting to return home. So again, they still needed nurses and wax and Red Cross workers to work alongside these men. So get, yeah, they didn't go home. Until That's a very good point, because of course, although the war ended, the, uh, the, 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 the wounds are still happening. People are still in hospitals. There are still people dealing with the trauma. So, you know, yeah. so some of the combat roles ended immediately but the role all the roles you've talked about today pretty much would continue uh, bec because of the nature of what they're doing yeah exactly so um i know like camp lucky strike um at la havre yeah where all pretty much all the blokes in europe at that point in time were ferried to this absolutely colossal camp to wait their turn to be sent home so that required huge they had quite a large number of american red cross workers at that particular camp um and obviously they there was all these ailments that these men had been hiding for so long you know well you know oh well i'll find, finally get my bad back looked at or my bad knee or you know these stomach pains i've been having and things like that so it's all of that suddenly then comes mm -hmm. to light so even though all the wounded from from the war had gone home you then started to get all these other things appearing and all these viruses that had started to spread around and um, things like meningitis were absolutely rife during the second world war you know so there was still all of that to treat with the nurses and the wax still had to do all this paperwork to get them home there was still all of that to be done um so yeah they they stayed as long as the men did um and quite often well after the men had gone home as well um so last but by no means least you know they did you know there were some of the girls that were in mainland europe they you know were quite close to the front lines and were in in direct danger but the girls that were here with the 8th air force weren't in any kind of direct danger um there were a few that can remember um you know particularly v1s those that arrived in the early days there was we were still under german attack um and things like that so um it's you know we have to remember that, that they were under some danger this young lady here is fight your pits um she was a red cross worker and she tell she um tells the story um she told her son um in her older years when she returned here to the uk to visit the bases while she was at earl's cone in essex working at the ninth air force headquarters she um remembered standing and watching this lone bomber circling the base round and round and round and I think was awestruck by it. it was the first time she's seen enemy aircraft and she was then rugby tackled from behind into a ditch by a serviceman going you know what the hell are you doing you get undercover he's you know he's he's bombing us you know he'd started to drop bombs at that point you know but she was just so she couldn't believe what she was seeing that she was here in this war zone this was happening in front of her um so you know there were there were these things happening and these young ladies you know when they first arrived it was such a, such an adventure these young ladies were on you know the first few nights spending a night out in out in a slip trench or in a bombshell was quite an adventure you know it's not exciting but that very very quickly that you know excitement wore off after that it was like well actually i'd rather just ignore the sirens and go to bed like everyone else I don't think I'm really in any direct danger. So um, they prefer to have a night's sleep over spending a night crouched down in a in a blast shelter um, as well. So, you know, there was a few things. Um, there were casualties. Um, there's 18 women buried at Maddingley American Cemetery in Cambridge um, alongside the many thousands of 8th Air Force flyers buried there. Um, so there's 18 women. Um, some of those are a result of aircraft crashes. This young lady in particular um emily ray she was a red cross worker in bedford and she was killed when she was on a sort of a bit of a joy ride on a b-17 out of thurley um she was invited to go on a flight to collect whiskey from northern ireland for a party they were having that night and sadly that b-17 hit fog and crashed into the side of a mountain on the isle of man and all 11 on board that day perished and this was only a matter of about a week and a half two weeks before ve day so they'd gone through all of that time and then you know lost their lives in what was seen to be a fun incident or a fun ride and everything else um, and there's a few that happened like that in aircraft crashes in vehicle crashes some of them died of um 
diseases and stuff that they suffered while over here um you know there's a few there was one of the companies of wax based over near birmingham massive outbreak of meningitis and so there's a couple of wax buried at cambridge that um died of meningitis um so you know and i'm working with the battle monuments commission to research those that they haven't yet got stories on um a lot of them have but there's a few that haven't got any stories there's a few that have got a, a, a slightly you know one of the red cross girls buried there looking like it might have been suicide but obviously very well mm. covered up by the military at that point in time um so yeah so you know it wasn't without its dangers that's for sure um but you know i always say they arrived here young girls very inexperienced in life, very young, like these men. But the job that they did, you know, in those three years that they were here, the jobs they did were unbelievable, you know, from the wax and their jobs to the nurses to the Red Cross, absolutely amazing. And they made the boys smile, no matter what role they were in, just seeing these American women made their day much better. Um, they did all their jobs without complaint. I've never heard or seen any first-hand accounts of any of them complaining about what they did or moaning that it wasn't recognised after the war. They were just happy to do what they did and make those boys smile. Um, and I always say they arrived as girls, but they went home as women. You know, mm. massive life lessons that they learned here. The jobs that they did were absolutely amazing. Um, so, yeah, and here's some of those wax again at, at Norwich um, at the Thanksgiving ceremony within the cathedral. So, yeah, it's it's a part of of um, what I do that I like the most. Again, you know, there's not many of us that do anything to do with the American women here, especially to do with the Eighth Air Force. Um, there's a lot of girls that do live in history and do, you know, everyone in, in mainland Europe and after Normandy and you know through that or in the pacific or in north africa and italy not so many represent the young ladies that were here with the eighth air force and it is such an untold part of that story so yeah hopefully people have learned a little bit tonight hopefully i've done busted a few myths that go yeah. around i mean absolutely i mean else, yeah so. brilliant tour de force i mean I, I i i don't have enough superlatives to, to say it i mean it's been I'm not just saying this because you're here, but it's my favourite show of the week by far um, and just outstanding. Um, what an incredible pre presentation, incredible photos, just just insanely good. So uh, you are absolutely down for the next date Air Force week on another subject, <laughs> whatever it is, whatever you want to tackle, you're, you're on the list if you want to be Thank there. You. Absolutely incredible. Really, really fantastic. So um, if, there's, if there's anything you, uh, uh, you want to publicise or how can people get in touch with you, Facebook groups, yeah. then please let us know. We can add the links to the description. But um, yeah, um, yeah. So I've got my own um, Facebook page. Um, I go as American Women in East Anglia during World War II. Um, I do public talks. Um, I've actually got one coming up with the 8th Air Force Historical Society at Alconbury on the 27th of November. Um, so if you have a look at my Facebook, I'm on there. Um, my contact details are on there as well. I also have, as you can see behind me, some of my my girls that I bring around me. I've got a little bit of a traveling museum. I've got a huge collection to do with what I've spoken about today, a massive collection. Um, and I take that around for other people to enjoy. Um, and people, are, you know, people can come up and, and see these uniforms for real and, and all the other things that come with it. Um, and also, if you're ever in East Anglia, come and pay us a visit at the 95th Bomb Group. You'd be more than welcome at the Red Feather Club. Um, very, very unique museum, unlike the Control Towers museums. It's um, the original enlisted men's club with the original bar in there. And the murals, are, all the original murals are still on the wall. Um, and every item in, in the museum is, is 95th. There's no item in that museum that hasn't come from the 95th Bomb Group. So quite unique in that respect. And yeah, if you're in the area, pay us a visit. We'd love to see you as well. Well, thank you very much. That's been absolutely extraordinary. So I'm just going to take you off screen for a second. I'll bring you back in a moment to say goodbye. But folks, nothing over the weekend, nothing tomorrow, nothing till El Alamein week starts on Monday. So I think it's 13 or possibly 14 shows devoted to El Alamein. We've got presenters of New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, Italy, UK, USA, and it will be fantastic. Is 13 or 14 shows too much on El Alamein? We'll soon find out. But anyway, thank you very much for your attention today. I'm going to bring Sefi back in. To say um, thank you very much. It was absolutely blind, blinding. So um, oh, you've, you've earned you. a well, well deserved whatever you want to have a drink of. You, you've deserved it. So um, absolutely fantastic. Thank you.
So this is Paul Woodhead and Sophie Green for World War II TV saying I will see you all next time. Cheers, everybody. Thanks for watching. Bye. Bye.